let's talk about incontestability. And sometimes inc the incontestability provision is referred to as a quiet title provision for trademarks. Of course, it's an incomplete one because it does not, in fact, provide incontestability for all possible challenges to a mark. But you can seek incontestable status after five years of your registration, after five years of continuous use, after registration, by filing certain affidavits. And the effect is that it gives you conclusive evidence of the mark's validity, registration, your ownership, and your exclusive right to use it in commerce. Now, under the statute, in addition to the provisions that allow challenge to your registration, notwithstanding incontestability, you know, things like functionality, generic status and the like, there are certain defenses that are preserved for trademark defendants, and they are listed in Section 33B of the statute, and it also includes those incorporated by Section 15's preamble, which cites Section 14.3, um, generic status, 14.5, loss of controls and related matters concerning a certification mark. So, you know, you can get kind of weedsy about this. So in incontestability, it's useful, but it is not a cure-all against any potential challenge. One interesting question that's come up is that if the statute specifically lists exceptions to incontestability, does that mean the things that aren't there are necessarily precluded? And this was the issue of the Park and Fly versus Dollar Park and Fly case, which went to the Supreme Court. That presented the question of whether an action for infringing an incontestable mark can be defended on the grounds that the mark is merely descriptive. And the Supreme Court said no, kind of an, an, an expressio unius kind of argument, right? That, you know, looking at the statute, the Lanham Act sets forth specific conditions where incontestable marks may be lost or deemed unenforceable. Descriptiveness is not on the list and is not a valid basis for resisting an infringement action. And this raised, you know, potential serious issues that there were a number of other kind of very natural defenses that were not at the time listed in the Lanham Act, which Congress ultimately you know, saw fit to include um, the existence of equitable defenses and the possibility that a mark is functional. But those potential you know, gaps in the statute have since been have since been plugged up. But it's going to get, you know, again, this, this this interesting question about what is the meaning of the Lanham Act? What do we do with the common baseline, common law baseline expectations of trademark law? If Congress incompletely codifies certain restrictions, does that mean that it implicitly meant to deny their inclusion into the Lanham Act? And the logic of Park and Fly is, yes, that is what they implicitly meant to do. And in the case of functionality and equitable defenses, um, Congress fortunately stepped in to make clear that those defenses remain valid and in existence. One tension that arguably exists in the realm of trademark incontestability is to the extent we have a weak examination system, then there's something very problematic or potentially problematic about incontestability. And so what do I mean by that? So suppose we, you know, as we do, we have a bar on descriptive marks, but if there's evidence of secondary meaning, then that bar can be surmounted and a registration may issue. But what if the trademark office, you know, burdened as it is with, you know, many, many applications and examination attorneys who can't spend too much time on any one application and who don't necessarily have the resources to, you know, bring to bear to challenge evidence of secondary meaning? What if the trademark office lets through a number of questionable cases of, of claims of secondary meaning for descriptive marks. Five years go by, the mark becomes incontestable, and a potential litigant then loses the chance to challenge a mark that arguably should never have gotten protection in the first place. And so it's worth noting that the stronger the examination at the front end, the less burdensome to the trademark system the granting of incontestability on the back end might be. And so I'm, I'm not, you know, arguing for a particular standard for incontestability, but it is sort of an interesting tension.
that's there in the trademark system. And we've talked in earlier lectures about the potential for applicants for a registration who have a very strong incentive to bring evidence to bear, even if it's questionable, asserting secondary meaning against the challenges faced by examining attorneys for marshalling that kind of evidence and not really having the resources to bring counter evidence and the need to have somebody you know, there to file an opposition. But the person who might need to file the opposition may not be in the position to do so or even know about it or even be in existence as a company at the time the registration is being pursued. And so there's this interesting, again, problem about what happens if incontestability then occurs almost as a matter of course five years down the line, and then the actual push comes to shove, the actual reason to fight this out emerges only after it's too late to challenge maybe questionable secondary meaning evidence at the front end. So again, it's an interesting question of institutional design, and it's sort of like part of a general question about how much scrutiny should there be at the front end, and you know what percentage of filings ought to lead to registration in the first place. You know, is the trademark office allowing too many, too few? And it's kind of a tricky, it's kind of a tricky question to answer because one has to kind of suss out one's priors about how many good marks there are, how many bad marks there are, and like what are the incentives of parties to, you know, kind of pursue things. There actually is data out there about how often registrations are granted for applications that were based on use over an 18 year period. And this is coming from an article by Barton Beebe about whether or not, you know, ask, that asks, is the trademark office a rubber stamp from the Houston Law Review in, in 2012? In this time period from, from 1989 to 2007, about 74% of applications based on use were ultimately granted. Um, only 37% of applications based on ITUs. However, that low rate was basically basically because in many cases, the applicant did not ultimately engage in a use. The public, the, the, the publication rate, um, you know, sort of like making these, you know, the, the initial approvals of these marks was at a fairly high rate and, you know, comparable to what we see in the ultimate granting of registrations for marks based on trademark use.